Ruchem Abloyim, thank you very much for coming, for attending. Welcome to our home. And this week we are going to continue a theme that we began last week with colors in Judaism. And um, again, this is the second lecture on that theme. Now today the flag of the state of the Israel is blue and white. This basic design recalls the Jewish prayer shawl, a talit, and based on Kabbalah, the Sephardic Jews wear a white talit to connect to the color of the white tzitzit. Ashkenazim Jews, for the most part, wear a white talit but with blue or black stripes. That's done as a remembrance of the blue string that is not worn today by most Orthodox Jews. Now, the Prebogodim, who was a halakha commentary, states that wearing a two-colored talit is a custom that traces its origin back to the Zohar, and the colors mentioned are both blue and black together with the white. Now, white is a primary color with stripes of either blue or black on the talit. Hasidus teaches us that white alludes to kindness, chesed, and the color blue is an antidote for the ayin hara, the evil eye. I believe that black colored stripes that we were added to the white majority to tell us that life has its ups and downs, black and white. But in the end, it's the black that makes the white even whiter. It's the valleys in our lives, the challenges, that makes the peaks, our successes, so much higher. And that's how we are wired, much like a heart monitor. It may also be an allusion to a, a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll, which is primarily white parchment with black ink. In Judaism, there are three types of commandments. <clears throat> they are mishpatim, civil laws, then there are ed edos, testimonies, such as holidays. All nations and religions are connected with civil laws and testimonies. What is unique about Judaism are the laws that we are referred to as chukim, statutes. They have no logic, and we do them only because God has commanded us to do so. Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. The ultimate chok, statute, is the paraduma, the red heifer. It must be completely red. If it has two black hairs, it is invalid. It is ritually slaughtered and then burnt to ash outside the walls of the temple, very unusual. The purpose of the paraduma was to purify someone who had been defiled by a dead body, which is the highest form of impurity in the world. In order for an individual who has been defiled by the dead to become pure once again, they must be sprinkled with the ashes of the paraduma, which is mixed with water. And this ritual is repeated twice, once on the seventh and then again on the, the pardon me, once on the third and then again on the seventh day of the purifying ritual. Now this ritual is performed by a priest, a Kohen, who becomes defiled by contact with the ashes. So the same ritual that makes the impure person pure makes the pure person, the priest, impure. A chok, no logic. So we see that the color red, which usually is a sign of passion, violence, and sin, in the case of the Paraduma, the red heifer, it acts in just the opposite fashion, counteracting spiritual impurity and allowing the defiled individual to become spiritually pure once again. Now, they would not, they would not be allowed to have contact with other people and to enter the precinct of the, of the temple until this ritual was done. We can see the same scenario with red wine, which we use sacrificially as an atonement for the sin of Adam eating from the tree of knowledge, which most commentaries seem to agree was a grape. Red, white, and blue represent fire, water, and air, respectively. They also stand for strength, kindness, and splendor, respectively. Or similarly, judgment, kindness, and mercy. I find it interesting that these are the same colors as the flag of the United States of America. We know that originally the founders of this country were religious Puritans that actually spoke Hebrew. This country was founded on Judaic Christian principles of judgment, kindness, and mercy. Now, colors are also associated with angels. White with the angel Michoel, red with the angel Gavriel, blue with the angel Uriel, 
and emerald green with the angel Rufoil. They are also associated with the forefathers, white with Abraham, Abraham, red with Isaac, Yitzchak, and blue with Yaakov, Jacob. They also connect with the Svirot, the traits of Chesed, Gevurah, and Tiferes, traits of kindness, severity, and beauty. Based on this logic, the Shulchan Aruch Yerodeah 178.1 states that there was a time when a woman was forbidden to wear red garments. Red is also connected to the laws of Nida, menstruation. The Mishnah in Nida 2.6 states that there are five kinds of blood that make a woman a Nida. They are red, black, the color of a crocus, the color of earthly water, or like diluted wine. They found that some of the rabbis were colorblind. Based on that observation and the fact that in those days, <clears throat> many communities only had one rabbi to serve them, they issued a decree that only those colors such as white or golden green are clean, which would allow a couple to engage in marital relations. All colors that lean towards red are unclean, which would forbid a couple from having marital intimacy. Now, green is a color that we see everywhere in nature. The current scientific view of what the color green is a calming, relaxing color. Andre Elliott, a professor of psychology at the University of Rochester, was quoted as saying there is some tentative evidence that green is relaxing because it is associated with growth and nature. This relaxing effect may have something to do with green light having a shorter wavelength than that of red light. Bright green trees were found to be more calming than trees of other colors. Another study showed that subjects who were told to wait in a red room had higher stress rating scores than those who waited in a green or white room. I remember Johnny Carson and all the late night shows, they would wait in the green room. I find it interesting that the color green is associated with envy and jealousy. There are those who trace its origin to Shakespeare in his plays Othello. In the 17th century BC, the poetess Sappho used the word green to describe the complexion of a stricken lover. The Greeks believed that jealousy was accompanied with an overproduction of bile, leading to a pallid green cast to the victim. Now, we see a totally different description of the color green in the story of Esther. In the Talmud, the Gemara and Megillah 13a states <clears throat> that there are many reasons why Esther was called Hadassah in the book of Esther 2.7. Now, Hadassah is a myrtle in Hebrew. And Rabbi Shul ben Korcho explains that Esther had a greenish complexion. Now, the Gemara continues by saying that she was given a touch of grace by God. And this is seen by the description of her beauty with such words as Yifat Toar and Yifat Mare and Esther 2.7, which stand for beauty in form and beauty in appearance. There are only a couple of colors that describe a person or their mood. They are blue and yellow. You may meet a friend and ask them, why do you look so blue, unhappy or downcast? What is the origin of this saying? Some say the word feeling blue comes from the tradition of ships flying blue flags and bearing a painted blue band around. This was done when a captain or another officer died. Another origin of the blues is derived from mysticism involving blue indigo, which was used by many West African cultures in death and bereavement ceremonies, where all the mourners' garments would have been dyed indigo blue to indicate suffering. There is also a saying in music of singing the blues. Blue is connected with death. When someone stops breathing, <clears throat> they turn blue, usually in a matter of two minutes. The lack of oxygen in the blood makes things look blue. Some people, when exposed to cold, have their lips and fingers turn blue. Now, the color yellow seems to be connected to cowardice, a state that is probably more closely linked to amphibians. Frogs, specifically yellow-bellied ones, that are known to hop and hide whenever you go after them. <clears throat> Jews who have been despised by other religions throughout the centuries were forced to wear yellow markers as a sign of denigration. 
This practice was used by the Nazis, making Jews wear yellow stars of David. So we see in the secular word the colors blue and yellow seem to connect to sadness, misery, and even death. Not so in the spiritual world. In Judaism, the color blue is connected with many garments and ceremonies that are positive and godly. There is a belief that blue is connected with the sea, also has an influence on the concept called Ayin Hara, the evil eye. Rashi, the famous medieval commentary on Tanakh and Talmud states that fish <clears throat> deter the evil eye. We know that fish have no eyelids and they are not always easily visible in the sea, which is an allusion again to the evil eye. As the Talmud in Brachot 20a states that fish are not affected by the ayin hara, the evil eye, because they are hidden from the eyes of man. This is also one of the reasons that Yaakov, our father, blesses his grandsons Ephraim and Manasseh before his death in Genesis 48:16 with the blessing, "Vigidu larov," that they should multiply like fish. Now the color blue is also connected with the Kohen Gadol, the high priest in the temple. Rav Shintrafel Hirsch explains that the Kohen Gadol wore tchelet. In addition, during the 40 years that the Jewish nation traveled in the desert, whenever they would dismantle the tabernacle, they would cover the ark, the golden table, the menorah, the golden altar, and the other utensils of the sanctuary with a fabric of tchelet, again, this blue color. Now, the word tchelet is a biblical blue dye, which really has been lost from Jewish tradition for many years. This dye is mentioned in the third paragraph of the Shema Yisrael. In this paragraph, the Torah commands us to attach tzitzit, fringes, to any four-cornered garment that we wear. One of those rings should be dyed with the techelet color. The Gemara describes the color of techelet as similar to the sea, and the sea is similar in color to the sky. It also states that the sky is a reflection of a sapphire brick that God has placed beneath his kise hakavod, his throne of glory. Blue is the color of the sky and hence of spirituality, a reminder of God and his throne of glory. Now the word techelet, according to Rabbi Shimshufo Hirsch, is connected to the word kala, which means end. He explains that techelet could be a violet color, violet, and can comments on how the spectrum of visible light stops after the color violet. The blue-violet light he describes as techelet has the shortest wavelength of all the visible light spectrum, <clears throat> which also means that it has the highest energy. On the opposite end, red light has the longest wavelength and therefore the lowest energy of the spectrum. So if we like Hirsch's view of blue as a godly color, and red is an earthly color, then the physical energy inherent in the colors would directly correlate to the spiritual level associated with them. Now, the word, Hebrew word techelis, blue, is similar to the Hebrew word tachlis, which means purpose. The verse in the third paragraph of Shema states that on the corner of your garment, you should attach a blue fringe, a psil techela. And in order for that, Ure'isem oso, that you should be able to see him, alluding to God Almighty. The taklis, the purpose of the techelis is for us to see the, see the strings, them, and remind ourselves, was khartem, to remember about all the commandments of God and that we <clears throat> have an obligation to observe them. Now, the color blue is connected with kingship, hence the term royal blue. Jewish kings were descended from King David, who was from the tribe of Yehuda, Judah. It is not a coincidence that the stone in the breastplate that represented the tribe of Yehuda was royal blue, as was their flag. Not only that, on their flag was a picture of a lion, the king of beasts. So as I've mentioned many times, nothing, nothing in life is an accident. The Jewish nation were only able to reform the commandment of Techelet, the blue fringe on their garments, for the first 850 years that the nation resided in the land of Israel. After the destruction of the first temple and the exile of the nation to Babylon, the mollusks that produced the Tehillah's color 
was no longer known to the sages. It's interesting that the gematria of the word techelet is 850. Again, nothing's an accident. After the flood, <clears throat> Noah was apprehensive about having children and repopulating the world. He was concerned that God would destroy his world again, but God assured him that he would never again bring a flood to destroy all mankind. He gave Noah a sign to that effect. He showed him a rainbow and said to, to Noah, the rainbow would be a reminder of that promise. But the question has to be, why a rainbow? So the rainbow is composed of seven basic colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Each of these colors are made up of 24 different shades and hues. All of them unite to form one single whole. And this is illusion for us, that just like a rainbow, all people should unite and come together in peace and in harmony. So the rainbow is a sign of unification and mercy. It reminds us of the sins of mankind and the punishment that they paid for those sins. The bow of the rainbow is facing up to the heavens, not down to earth. This is a sign that God will not destroy the world again with the flood. There was a tradition thought to be associated with Kabbalah of wearing a thin scarlet or crimson string around one's left wrist as a way to ward off misfortune brought on by the evil eye. It seems to be a custom that has been around since the early 1900s. It may well find its origin in the book of Genesis in the portion of <clears throat> Vayesha 38-27, where Tamar became, becomes pregnant by her father-in-law Yehuda, and she gives birth to twin boys. The verse states that as she was in labor, one of the twins put out his arm. The midwife who was attending grabbed it and tied a crimson thread around his arm. The custom is to tie the ribbon on one's left wrist, which serves to ward off negative energies. And according to Kabbalah, negativity originates from the left hand. Again, the side of Gvura, of severity. We also find the color red mentioned in the Torah in connection with Esau and his birth. It states in the book of Bereshit in the portion of Toldos, 25-24, that the first one was Admoni, reddish. Then in verse 29 it states that Esau came back from the field and he was famished. Yaakov was cooking lentils and Esau said to Yaakov, give me a swallow minha adom from that red stuff. Now red is a color that is associated with blood, passion, enthusiasm, violence, and even murder. The planet Mars is referred to as the red planet. Each of the seven planets are associated with a color. The color of the sun is a combination of orange and red. However, it is generally considered red in color. The moon is pale white, but it reflects the orange-red rays of the sun. Mars is of a red color, but it also reflects the yellow rays of the sun. Mercury is a green color and reflects green rays. Jupiter is an orange-yellow color, but reflects mainly blue rays of the spectrum. Venus is considered to be a pure white, but it also reflects indigo rays of the spectrum. And Saturn is a black color and reflects violet rays of the sun. <clears throat> Our sages tell us that Asa was influenced by the planet Mars from the moment of his birth. There is a measure that states that Yaakov was cooking lentils to serve to his father, since his grandfather, Arvind, had just passed away. And lentils are a food that we feed to a mourner. The measure states that on the day that Esau had, com that day, Esau had committed five major sins, among them murder and rape, sins that are connected to the color red. Now Yaakov gave his favorite son Yosef a kasonis possum, a coat of many colors. Why many colors? Why not just one or two? Yaakov saw Yosef as a leader of the family. It was his hope and prayer that Yosef would be the one to unite all the brothers into one family unit, one united nation. The coat was meant to be a symbol of that unity. However, instead of uniting the family, it brought about the exact opposite results in that it became a symbol of division among the brothers. 
best laid plans of mice and men. There's another allusion to the color red when the Torah refers to a murderer. It calls them shofech domim, a spiller of blood. When you embarrass another person, you cause them to blush, and the blood rushes to their face. After a time, the blood drains and then they become ashen. This movement of blood to and from the face, the reddening and whitening, are tantamount to murder. Something we should all keep in mind. Whatever colors, Dylan said, whatever colors you have in your mind, I will show them to you and you will make them shine. So we see that colors play an important role in all facets of our lives, both secular and religious. It makes our lives more appetizing, more appealing, and more enjoyable. May God bless us that our lives are filled with peace and harmony, like the colors of a rainbow. And with that, may we usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. Thank you again very much for listening. May God bless you again with happiness and joy. And may you be safe. Have a great Shabbat. Again, thank you again.